From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. Here's how it started. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. A populist promise to what U.S. President Donald Trump calls the silent majority back at his inauguration in 2017. And a lot has happened since then. Here's how it's going. Americans and people around the world in disbelief over the state of the U.S. Toxic partisanship grips their politics and policies. Allies, like Canada, have been pushed away. A pandemic surges as the number of dead barrels toward a quarter of a million people, with a president who says he takes no responsibility. Jared Yates Sexton, author, political analyst, host of the Muckrake Political Podcast, says this is America. He's written the book American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. It's a look into American history and what he calls the foundational myths that the United States is built on. How the stories it has told itself, about itself, are fundamentally wrong. And how the idea of American exceptionalism has become doctrine. On the eve of the US election, this is about how America got here, where it's headed next, and what its people can do to fix it. Jared, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So election day is almost here. Have you voted yet? How are you feeling about things heading into election night? Yeah, I did vote. I voted a couple of days ago, and it was one of those moments that I feel like it's out of my hands at this point. I'm on an airplane, there's a little bit of turbulence. I understand that gripping the side rest doesn't really make a difference at this point. So I'm ready for Tuesday. Like all of us, you're just a passenger on this trip. You're not running the show. I'm on the crazy train and I'm heading where I'm heading. That's all that I know. So you wrote a book, American Rule, about this crazy train and you you take a really deep look into American history and how the U.S. has come to this moment politically and culturally. What made you want to research and write this book? Well, you know, I was covering the Trump campaign back in 2016 and that's sort of where I gained the platform that I had. And I was going into rallies and I was talking to people and I was reporting on the fact that the Trump supporters that I talked to were a lot like my family. They were people who were frustrated, they were angry. And on top of that, to be frank, they had a lot of racist, misogynistic, and even fascistic sort of leanings. And so I was sort of sounding the alarm back in 2016 that the Trump movement was dangerous. But like a lot of other people, I think there was a part of me that didn't believe that he could possibly win the presidency, that there was some sort of moral arc to the universe, that somebody like him would be considered and spit out like so much bad food, you know, that the system would take care of it. And after he was elected, I think that a lot of us had to reconsider what we thought about America. And I wanted to go back in American history and sort of try and understand exactly how we could have arrived at this point. And what I found was really shocking. What I found was that I did not understand the actual history of America. I only had an understanding of the story of America, which is, of course, this idea that America is, you know, the hero of the world, the champions of democracy, liberty and equality. And what I found was that from the very beginning, that was a propagandized story that was used for power and control. And it was almost inevitable at that point that we were going to arrive at some point to Donald Trump. Right. You call them foundational ideas or myths. You've mentioned them that these are foundational myths to what the United States and America is all about. What are these myths? Well, the main myth that has driven America particularly to this point is American exceptionalism. It's the idea that our founders were motivated by, in some cases, people believe it's a higher philosophical drive the idea of democracy or, or you know, human representation. Some people believe that it's more of a religious, holy type of energy that our founders were inspired by a Christian God or some sort of, you know, creator to be his champion of the universe. And this idea is not only 
false. It's dangerously false. It's something that has been used to legitimize everything from human slavery to the genocide of the native people to the oppression of vulnerable populations over and over and over again. And what you actually find when you look at American history is that our founding and the direction of the country have moved exactly in the opposite direction of those espoused principles. Right. So, you know, four years ago and over the past four years, many Americans have said this isn't who we are. But through Trump's policies, his actions, you sort of make the argument through history, this is America, that a lot of this has shaped up into this moment. Sure. And, you know, this is one of those things. A lot of people have responded to Donald Trump saying, you know, our founding fathers are rolling over in their graves thinking about the idea of Donald Trump. But in essence, if you actually look at the founding of this country, it was founded by a white supremacist aristocratic movement. The framers of the Constitution, who actually didn't even have authorization to write a constitution, they took it upon themselves, you know, without any sort of authorization. They created a government and they created a society that was based on the idea that white men with a lot of wealth and a lot of power were the safest repositories for liberty. So they needed to be in control of society and common people and people of color needed to be subservient. That was how this whole thing started. So if you actually went back in time and told the founders There is this white man who is supposedly a billionaire. He's one of the richest people in the country. They would think that was wonderful. They would think that that was exactly how the government should be working and that that man, whoever he was, had to have been talented and competent and have the best interest of the country and the world, you know, in in his heart. But what we've actually seen is this was not only an overestimation of what the founders thought the country would turn into, but it is one of the more dangerous things that is going in the world, which is the idea that just because you were wealthy or powerful means that you were competent or honorable, which we know now that it is not true. Right. And that even in your research, it shows that there is a central thread of white supremacy throughout American history and the people who make the biggest decisions in the country. Yeah. And if you actually go back, and this was one of the more shocking things, I didn't know that James Madison, who's the main architect of the U.S. Constitution, I didn't know that he had like detailed notes on how the Constitution was written. And if you actually go back and read his notes, what you find is incredible white supremacy at the heart of the founding of the country and a complete disrespect of common people, right? You see a very aristocratic white supremacist power leading to the founding of this country. And then throughout history, what you see is that continually the people who hold power and the people who determine the future of the country are people who traffic in those ideas. It is inextricably intertwined the history of America and the history of aristocratic white supremacy. And when you actually look at how our history has played out, it's very clear that this has not only been a consistent problem, but it's how we've arrived at this current moment of crisis. You also write about how in fairly recent history, too, that there's been kind of this coded language, that there is a nod to white evangelicals. And one of the biggest examples that you use is Ronald Reagan talking about a shining city on a hill. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life. Can you talk about how that figures into this idea of, again, the myths of America and the myths that Americans tell themselves? Yeah, to tell the story, I have to go back into the 1950s, 1960s. And I want to point out that there's a group of evangelical leaders in this country. They've become known as the evangelical right. But to be clear about who they are, and we're talking about people like Jerry Falwell, of course, you know, the moral right, whatever you want to call them. They were actually neo-Confederate preachers. These are people who believed in white supremacy and the idea that, you know, the white race was better than every other race and that they believed in the Confederate States of America and the idea that there should be a separate sort of society. Well, they gained power starting in the 1960s and 1970s in opposition to segregation, in opposition to the civil rights. By the time the late 70s roll around, and of course, eventually the 1980s, 
They form a partnership with Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan has been mythologized as sort of a, you know, sort of a Christian warrior. But the truth is that Reagan wasn't actually religious. Reagan was actually more what you would call occultish and spiritual. He was actually really obsessed with, like, experts in occults and people who talked about secret symbols and Atlantis and all of this esoteric sort of, you know, supernatural stuff. Like he believed in astrology, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, actually, Nancy Reagan would call their astrology with state secrets and ask for advice on how... <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is stuff that like people talked about at the time and they just sort of laughed about and now it's been hidden to history. So Reagan believed that America, and this is really far out there, but it's completely true, and this is the mythology that has animated the modern American right. Ronald Reagan believed, through the ideas of a guy named Manley P. Hall, that America was chosen by God and generations upon generations of secret societies to become a force for good in the world. And as a result, the Cold War was a supernatural battle between the Christian good and satanic bad or evil. And so The Shining City on the Hill, which unfortunately has come to determine a lot of modern American history, became sort of the de facto reality in which Americans lived. Anybody who was living back in the 1980s might remember things like the satanic panic or the moral panic. This idea, and by the way, it's kind of reoccurring now with a lot of our conspiracy theories. You might remember there was this idea that satanic cults were stealing children and sacrifice them, you know, and, and all, the, all these weird things. There were hidden messages in our music and our movies and all that stuff. And what ends up happening is that Reagan is so successful in his politics that eventually even the Democratic Party has to start living within this supernatural reality where America is the champion of the world and to criticize it is almost to undermine a religious mission. So all of a sudden you reach this very bizarre point where people start believing that America is not only exceptional, but that America is divine. And it keeps Americans from questioning what's happening in the country. And it also, it reinforces everything from white supremacy to, again, aristocratic economic control. It's a very weird chapter in our history that's still reverberating. Right. To criticize the country is therefore to criticize its divine goodness of the United States is how some people see it. Yeah, it's a religiously, supernaturally charged dichotomy. So basically, if you believe in American exceptionalism, the idea that America is godly and divine in its purpose, then all of a sudden that also creates through Christian mythology, this idea that anything that opposes it is automatically evil. And then all of a sudden you start having these conspiracy theories, which obviously sort of come from, you know, if a divine country has a problem, right? If we have an economic crisis, if we have like a moment where we're in decline, you have to start questioning, well, if we're chosen by God to be perfect and his champion, well, then how could we ever have a decline? And the answer is very, very simple. You automatically say there's a conspiracy. And immediately anyone who starts questioning the divine mission of America becomes a traitor or a terrorist and they have to be dealt with as a heretic. So there's like this very weird religious dichotomous element to what's happening right now. We'll be right back. We see the president of the United States talking about a deep state conspiracy. Haters, absolute haters, left wing haters, angry mobs, deep state radicals and their fake news allies. That anybody who's an opponent of his is a traitor of the state. And we see these themes playing out again and again. Yeah. And so this deep state thing, and this is something that we need to understand. So these conspiracy theories are cyclical. They're always happening and they're always sort of revitalizing. They actually go back I'm, for a new project. I'm actually looking at the history of Western civilization. These things were in place during ancient Rome and they just continually played themselves out. But in modern history, we see what we've called the deep state or even QAnon and in the New World Order, which happened, of course, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. These are all echoes of what's called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is, of course, one of the original anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. But the entire idea always gets boiled down to this. There's a three-sided conspiracy against America or against whatever country is having a hard time. 
One is that we have an enemy on the outside that involves puppet masters, which, by the way, almost always means Jewish puppet masters, right? Because it's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. The second leg are traitors on the inside, a fifth column in the country that is betraying the interest, almost always liberals, right? This is why they're saying Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, they need to go to jail, they need to go to Gitmo, whatever they have to say. And the third, and because it's a white supremacist conspiracy theory, and people need to remember this, that white supremacists look down on people of color and believe that they need paternal control, right? It's that old animating idea that meant that like slave owners had to take care of like their property, right? So it's this idea, and you see this with like the Black Lives Matter movement. All of a sudden it's like, well, these people are being manipulated by Marxist, right? They're being manipulated by someone like a George Soros. So that triangle of a conspiracy, and you'll notice that all three of those are people who either antagonize white supremacist control or aren't likely to vote in favor of that white supremacist control. So it creates this insulating structure and narrative where people aren't able to criticize and or assemble in order to challenge the white supremacist aristocratic rule. So in talking about these myths, you talked about how it's been used as justification for violence against especially people of color, whether that's colonization or slavery or, or, or even violence against members of the BIPOC community now. And that brings us to 2020. And Trump himself has repeatedly refused to denounce white supremacists. What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. Supremacists and would right you like me to condemn? White Proud supremacists boys. and right Proud Proud boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. His entire campaign is built around the idea of make America great again. You're not the first to say this, but you do argue that Trumpism and the support for his brand of politics is essentially refashioned fascism. What have you seen over the last four years that tells you that? Well, so here's one of the problems is, unfortunately, post-World War II, we've lost all understanding of what fascism is and was, right? We like to pretend that fascism was this strange aberration in the 20th century in Western Europe. Well, that's not at all true. Fascism is constantly sort of bubbling up and constantly sort of, you know, fighting for the hearts and minds of people, so to speak. We also don't like to talk about the fact that America has been <laughs> cultivating grounds for fascism in the past. I mean, we've engaged in tons of proto-fascistic behavior. Adolf Hitler, for instance, absolutely loved America for its slavery and its founding, the Confederate States of America, and eventually the segregated laws that we had. He actually wanted to work with America, and we had a lot of fascistic groups in this country that were calling for us to either enter the war on the side of the Axis powers or to stay out of the war. And that was all, of course, pre-Pearl Harbor. Well, what you end up finding is that fascism is a pretty, you can pin it down what it is. Fascism, first and foremost, is about weaponized nostalgia. It's about saying the country that we're in has a divine purpose or a divine mission, but we're not there because of a conspiracy against us. And again, it's that three-sided conspiracy, right? And we have to end this conspiracy, and that means we have to do it violently, and we also have to control reality because those quote-unquote puppet masters and traitors are always manipulating reality, right? This is why everyone always talks about the idea that puppet masters control the media and the narrative and all of this. But it's this idea that a strong man, quote unquote, has to control reality and that their reality, and tell me if this sounds familiar, their reality is more real than science or empirical evidence or any of those things because fascism is actually about creating your own reality and forcing other people to live within it. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that? You're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains Wait a alternative that facts. There's... And in a lot of ways, it's a minority group in the country that is losing power that starts destroying democratic institutions, whether it's the right to vote or you know the checks and balances that are supposed to hold them in, while also propagating conspiracy theories and also separate mythologies. You are a real American, they are traitors or terrorists. And if they're traitors or terrorists and you own America, then it's within your rights to preemptively, and this is of course a holdover from the war on terror, if the terrorists are going to hurt you, you have the right to hurt them first, right? So you have the right to attack them, you have the right to imprison them, you have the right to restrict their rights. 
And that's what fascism is. But unfortunately, we've lost that behind this mythology that, you know, it it was something that happened in Western Europe and that we defeated it. And that was all we had to do with it. And even in the day to day, you mentioned reshaping reality, especially during a pandemic, to not listen to scientists and doctors. And he's repeatedly gone after Dr. Anthony Fauci, has said the media is fake news if they don't agree with everything that he says. We're, We're seeing that play out again and again in fascistic behavior is what you're saying. Yeah, the the pandemic is a really weird moment. And and by the way, we're talking about some esoteric deep stuff here, right? Because one of the lessons that we're getting a crash course in is that objective reality has never actually existed. What we've actually dealt with is sort of an enforced objective reality, right? We talk about this period in the 1950s. We call it the consensus, where apparently all Americans agreed and, you know, we all lived in the suburbs and everything was great. Well, if you talk to a person of color or, you know, an LGBTQ American or a woman in the 1950s, they would tell you that that wasn't a great existence. It was a reality enforced upon them by the white majority, right? And intimidation and violence and political oppression. What's happening right now is we're in another moment like that. Make America Great Again is about going back to a mythical time in America and pretending that that reality was real. Well, that reality was never real in the first place. We all have different realities. Reality is subjective. Right now, a minority movement in this country is trying to impose their reality, which is so weird and convoluted that when you look at it, it's almost laughable. The idea that you shouldn't listen to scientists, you shouldn't listen to doctors, look at YouTube and find some conspiracy theories that sound right to you, and that's your reality. Well, that might seem laughable, but what happens, particularly with fascistic movements, is if they gain enough strength momentum and power, and they're willing to use violence, they can make everyone else around them accept that reality under the duress of violence. And so fascism is all about inverting reality to your own personal usage for political and economic power. And that's unfortunately what we're seeing happen in America right now. This year has been a reckoning on so many fronts from the way we've lived our lives, you know, the problems of our healthcare system, social and racial inequality that has existed for generations. Do you think that all this tension that's happening in the United States right now, is that the United States reckoning with its history now in this moment? Do you see it as that? Absolutely it is. We're on the precipice of something. We're in a real moment of sea change. And actually history shows us this. Is There are these moments where what I would call the illusion of America flickers. Right. There's moments where all of a sudden this idea that we're divinely inspired and motivated, it doesn't look the same anymore. You know, there's like these moments where America is, of course, you know, the world's policeman or it's the main superpower. It's got the hegemony, all this idea. Donald Trump is so transparently incompetent and is such an obvious liar that all of a sudden he makes you re-question everything from white supremacy to the meritocracy to, you know, American law and inequality, all of these things. So we are in a moment right now where most Americans are starting to question not only America, but a lot of things that would have been completely unthinkable a couple of years ago. Like during Black Lives Matter, there was a a really shocking poll that said something along the lines of 70% of Americans during the protest were starting to understand systemic racism, which to get 70% of Americans to agree on anything is shocking, right? But to see that movement, all of a sudden you start to realize Well, who are the other 30%, right? So what we have in the country is particularly, again, a very small movement. Roughly 25 to 30% of the country has decided that they want to keep living within this reality. They don't want to be pulled out. They don't want to think about systemic inequality. They don't want to think about systemic racism. They don't want to look at American history and understand how we've arrived at this point. And they're violently resisting even the discussion of it, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why Donald Trump is pushing patriotic education. It's the idea that we have to reinforce these mythologies and make sure that future generations, those demographic changes, don't trouble that illusion anymore because they're in danger right now. So I think we're at a moment, what I call a precipice. I think it could get worse, but I think it could get a lot better. We just don't know which way it's going to go at this point. So you think these foundational myths or perhaps a better understanding of them, you think that it plays a direct role in this 2020 election? It must play into perhaps how people 
view their political system and who they vote for. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think Donald Trump has positioned himself as the champion and the protector of the American myth, which is a really powerful appeal, but he's really bad at it. You know, it's really kind of sad and see-through, you know, hugging flags, these big gaudy celebrations in front of Mount Rushmore, which, by the way, Another president holding a rally in front of Mount Rushmore on the 4th of July would be like, oh, okay, that's just sort of corny political pandering. With Donald Trump, it just looks bad. You know, it just looks very threadbare and and ugly and even menacing to a certain extent. And so what we're dealing with right now, particularly leading up to this election, is whether or not we're going to have an actual reckoning with who we are and where we've been. Trump is angrily saying, you don't have to. And if you continue to elect me and continue to cede me power and authority, you're not going to have to do this on any front, whether it is in our laws, our education, our culture, our politics. This is an angry counter-revolution is really what it comes down to. Jared, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about this. Thanks for having me. That's Jared Yates Sexton, author of American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. Jared also hosts the Muckrake Political Podcast. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Sabah Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.